Hello everybody and welcome to part 2 of the Battle of White Plains custom multiplayer game. In this particular game, the two teams have chosen their setups here at the start. For the Confederates, they are advancing from the southern part of the battlefield map and the Federals from the northern part of the map. We're going to talk more about both sides and the plans that they chose, but we're going to begin first with the Confederate side. For the Confederates, they have Ken as their captain on the team, along with Gary K and Gary H. So a couple of Garys and Ken. Ken will be leading Stark's division, which is actually Jackson's division. Gary K will be playing as Richard Ewell, and Gary H as A.P. Hill. Everyone here commands a division. The Confederates opted to go with a setup which put two of their divisions arriving from the southwest, and one division arriving from the southeast. Let's zoom in first over on the southwestern part of this map. Here we have A.P. Hill's division already on the field of battle, and Richard Ewell's division arriving from the south. Part of A.P. Hill's division will be fixed at the beginning of this battle, but they will be released pretty early in the contest. These two divisions can reach any number of different points after a few hours of marching, if they follow the Old Tavern Road, they will end up at White Plains. If they go up the Brooks Corner Road, they will end up at Brooks Corner, which is another objective point. Moving now over to the east, we find Stark's division, along with Stonewall Jackson, advancing along this road. They are moving directly towards Broad Run, and just beyond that is White Plains. At the front of this column is Beverly Robertson's brigade, he has two regiments of cavalry equaling 500 men. That will allow the Confederates to reach some of these points a little bit sooner than the Federals will. The Federals have no cavalry in this battle. Alright, we're going to zoom all the way out here to the overhead map. We're going to now talk about the Confederate Command Meeting. This is the first meeting of the Confederate officers in this game, and they're going to discuss what their general plan is going to be for this battle. Stonewall Jackson spoke up first in the meeting, and he said that this appears to be a meeting engagement battle, so there will not be a lot of strategy to it. It is get there the firstest with the mostest. I don't expect any grand flanking maneuvers by the Yankees, and do not believe they will approach using the mountainous road to the east. I expect them to either attack White Plains directly from the north at once, or to try to take the western objectives before concentrating for a larger attack on White Plains. Either way, I expect to attack them and drive them. Our cavalry should spot them quickly enough to give us an idea of what they are going to do. We will concentrate at White Plains with all of our forces before acting. So the Confederates are going to move directly towards White Plains with all three of their divisions. And the rebel plan is pretty simple. Find and attack the Yankees. In a shorter game, that seems to be a pretty straightforward and obvious plan. With the limited number of turns in this game, this might be a wise move just to keep it simple, and try to gain the initiative in the battle at the very start. But is it wise to completely mass all their forces in just one area? We're going to have to wait and see. Personally, I think if you're going to mass all your forces in one area, you always need to leave a little something out. Something to distract and amuse the enemy elsewhere. Something to, even just temporarily, distract them and force them to focus forces elsewhere on the battlefield map. Personally, I would have liked to have seen them send at least a brigade from A.P. Hill's division north towards Brooks Corner. And I think if they would have done that, they would have distracted the Federals in that area and given them something to think about. In a short game like this, just the advance of one single brigade against Brooks Corner would have likely tied down two or three times as many Federals as Confederates in that area. So I think this was probably a missed opportunity for the Confederates to create another front on this battlefield. Because when you concentrate in one area, it really does make it easy for your opponent to do the same exact thing. And it just makes it easier for them overall. You want to make it as hard as possible for your opponent, and you want to keep them guessing about your plan for as long as possible. 
and when you clump your troops in one area, there's really not much for them to worry about except that one area. All right, we're going to go over to the Federal Command meeting now. The Federals are led by Walt Plain as Irvin McDowell, and they have Jim Plain as Rufus King, Robert F. as John Reynolds, and Scott as James Ricketts. Robert will also be commanding George Sykes's division. They arrive behind Reynolds's force and a little bit later in the battle. Looking now at the Federal side of the map, you will see that they opted to take the three main roads heading towards White Plains, Midway, and Brooks Corner. They opted not to use the easternmost road, the one that ran through the mountains towards White Plains. I personally think that was a mistake not to put any troops on that road, but that's just me. It also just happens to be exactly what the Confederates thought they would do. Stonewall Jackson did not believe they were going to use that road, and so that road does not factor into his plans at all. If there was a federal force coming down that road, things would get really interesting very quickly for the Confederates, but the Federals chose to ignore that road, and now we're going to see how that plays out. Zooming in first on the eastern side of the map, on this road towards White Plains is advancing Ricketts' division, and they will be advancing directly south along the White Plains Road. Moving over to the west now, we find two more Federal Divisions already on the map. Irvin McDowell leads the Central Force, and that is the division of John Reynolds. Reynolds is backed up by George Sykes' division, and together they are moving along the Midway Road. By moving south on this road, they will of course eventually reach Midway in the center of the battlefield. Over on their right flank, furthest to the west, is the division of Rufus King. They will be moving on the Brooks Corner Road and southward towards that objective point. Zooming back out now to the overhead map, we have four total federal divisions moving along three main roads towards the objectives in the center of the map. Now let's go to the Union Command meeting and discuss what their plans were. For the Federals, they opted obviously to advance along all three roads. McDowell wrote his generals that, We will advance and look to battle the enemy between White Plains and Brooks Corner. With luck, we will be able to concentrate our full force against a single enemy column and crush it. And just like with the Confederates, this is a very simple plan. But I do like it. There's nothing fancy here, just find the enemy and deal with them. The Federals are staying relatively compact, which can be a good thing, but as I said with the Confederates, there's really not much to worry about with this plan from the Confederate perspective. There's no side columns to worry about, and the Federals are going to pretty much stick to just one part of the board. Should be pretty easy for the Confederates to get tabs on them and watch their movements as they go across this map. So putting both plans on the map now, you can see the Confederates are moving directly towards White Plains to concentrate there, and the Federals will be moving on three separate objectives, hoping to capture at least two, but ideally three. It does seem pretty obvious that the main battle will occur in this area here. How long it takes for the Federals to realize there's no real Confederates at Brooks Corner or Midway remains to be seen. And which direction the Confederates are going to attack once they reach White Plains, we also have to wait and find out. So let's get to it. The battle begins. Turn number one occurs at 10.40 a.m. in the game, and as always in my games, I use this as an administrative turn, so I just skip it. But you can see all the forces already on the map there. And I'll just put the labels right there on all the objectives, just to remind you where they're at real quick. Rotating now to turn number two, you'll see all the forces have shifted just a little bit. It is 11 a.m. in the game now. There are 17,000 Confederates on the field and 6,100 Federals. Zooming in here real quick over on this part of the map, you will notice that Robertson's Confederate regiments have already almost reached Broad Run. The cavalrymen, of course, move much quicker than the infantry, and they're going to be out there scouting ahead of Stark's main column. Going back out now to the overhead map, 
we're going to rotate now to turn number three. And once more, you can see all the forces have advanced a little bit. Over on the federal side, you have King moving in the west, Reynolds in the center, and Ricketts in the east. For the Confederates, A.P. Hill's division continues to be unfixed a little bit at a time, and they are backtracking and moving towards White Plains behind Richard Ewell's division. Meanwhile, over in the east, Stark's division is moving towards Broad Run and then White Plains where the Confederate cavalry has almost reached. Robertson's brigade, once they reach White Plains, I'm not really sure which way they'll go, but I'm going to guess north, probably towards Ricketts' division to see what's along that White Plains road. Alright, moving forward to turn number four. The Confederates now have 22,000 men on the map, and that is their entire army. So the Confederates are completely concentrated for this battle at this point. Meanwhile, the Federals have 17,588 men on the battlefield. They're still expecting about 10,000 more men to arrive over the next few hours. The Confederates do have their artillery already on the field, while the Federals are still waiting on theirs to arrive in another 20 or 40 minutes. Let's zoom in on this central part of the map here, around White Plains and Midway. Robertson's cavalry has already moved out to scout the area in front of the Confederate infantry divisions, and they've run up against Federal infantry along White Plains Road. Not only that, but they have spotted the Federals moving towards Midway from higher ground near White Plains. Once the infantry divisions of Ewell and Stark arrive, we're going to have to wait and see whether they turn west to attack the Federals near Midway, or if they opt to continue north and fight a battle north of White Plains against Ricketts' division. Alright, we're going to zoom back out now, and that is the end of turn number four, and we are at 11.40 a.m. in the game. And that is a good place to stop because we will have another command meeting at the top of the next hour. After that command meeting, it will be two hours between communication turns for the teams, and that's going to make it a lot harder for these two teams to coordinate moving forward. So they better be all on the same page after their next command meeting. As always, thank you for watching. I do hope you enjoyed part two of the Battle of White Plains multiplayer game. In the next episode, the battle will quickly escalate, I believe, as the two armies collide around the area of White Plains. And we're going to observe as the two sides meet up for the first time during this battle and plan their next moves for the 12 to 2 p.m. time period. All right, everybody, I hope to see you back for the next episode. And until then, just remember, keep gaming.